What's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Let's clarify something right off the get-go here. Uh, this morning, this Friday morning, yes, I did the artwork for the thumbnail of this video. There it is right there. I used a very a very technical program called Paint to uh, to create this little design here for you. I'm sure you appreciate that. Hey, we're going to get into a cool question today. We're going to talk about whether or not Jonathan Edwards was a Calvinist and a a five-point Calvinist to be uh, to be particular. Now, in Calvinism and Reformed theology, um, Reformed theology more broadly, we sometimes ask whether or not a person is a is a Calvinist or a five-point Calvinist or a four-point Calvinist. Usually, if there's any point left off of the TULIP acronym, it's the uh, it's the point of limited atonement. And so, sometimes people describe themselves as a four-point Calvinist. Sometimes people describe themselves as a five-point Calvinist, etc. Well, what are the five points? Let's tick through them really quickly here. They actually come from the Synod of Dort, and I'm not sure who first came up with the TULIP acronym, but uh, the five points of Calvinism do come from the Synod of Dort, which in itself was a response to the Remonstrance movements uh, led by Jacob Arminius and others who. Basically, uh, we're a little a little bit offended by some of the some of the reformed confessions. Thought they'd maybe stated things too too directly, too baldly, too strictly, perhaps when it comes to salvation. And so they kind of gave some pushback to the reformed movement about things like human free will and the sovereignty of God and our ability to choose salvation. And and there's a special concern about who Christ died for. And so in the Synod of Dort, um, they they doubled down on what had been heretofore the Reformed principles of soteriology, that is to say how somebody is saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the five points of Calvinism are as follows. The T stands for total depravity, which means that we're sinful through and through. The U stands for unconditional election, which means that we are chosen by God before the foundations of the world. The L stands for limited atonement. Some people prefer particular atonement to that. We're going to get into that one in just a moment because that is the one that most people would like to debate about within the five points. I stands for irresistible grace, and then P stands for the perseverance of the saints. So when we talk about five-point Calvinism, it is a little bit anachronistic to suggest that these five points came from John Calvin himself. Now, I personally believe that Calvin would have held to all five points. Uh, some people will tell you that if you read through the Institutes, you don't see that L for particular atonement or limited atonement, L, limited atonement very clearly in Calvin's Institutes. That point is a greatly debated in the Calvin versus the Calvinists controversy. But we're talking about Jonathan Edwards today, uh, my study subject, my favorite theologian, not a perfect theologian. There's lots of things in Edwards that are kind of weird. And some people have even made careers kind of pointing out the weirdness of Jonathan Edwards. Um, Oliver Crisp has done a lot in relationship to Edwards on occasionalism and idealism and continuous creation. These are some of the strange things that Edwards talks about very often in his private notebooks, not so much in his public preaching. Um, and even our Scott Clark has a pretty well-known article on his blog, the Heidel blog, in which he gives several warnings about why Jonathan Edwards is a little bit of a strange brew when it comes to some of his theological convictions. So it's not very, it's not very odd for me to hear that question. Was Jonathan Edwards a five-point Calvinist? And I'm going to do my best to answer that question for you this very morning. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to look at um, one of Edwards's most important works, The Freedom of the Will, because I think the question is answered very clearly and very directly here in this work. I do have a, an edition of Freedom of the Will right here on my desk. I'll point uh, um, post a link to this book in the description of this video if you'd like to get it. This is not from the Yale works, though. This is one done by Soli Deo Gloria Publications, a division of Reformation Heritage Books. Um, it's still a good edition of The Freedom of the Will, but the pagination is different from the official Yale works. And in this video, I'm going to be citing the pagination of the official Yale works, because that's how most Edwards scholars refer to uh, Jonathan Edwards' writings. Now, I will be the first to confess that The Freedom of the Will is not my favorite work that Jonathan Edwards ever did. In fact, I think it's one of the harder works to read. A lot of people want to get interested in Edwards and jump right into The Freedom of the Will. I think that's a big mistake. Freedom of the will is very technical, very dense, very philosophical. He uses all kinds of terms that many readers are not familiar with. 
And so freedom of the will is very, very much the deep end of the pool when it comes to Jonathan Edwards studies. I would prefer people to get into a bunch of other things first before they went to freedom of the will, maybe reading the religious affections or some thoughts on the revival or the distinguishing marks of the work of the spirit of grace. There's a bunch of other things I'd recommend first. However, if we want to answer the question as to whether or not Edwards was a five-point Calvinist, he does directly answer this question in the freedom of the will. So what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to give you a basic overview of Edwards's argument in freedom of the will, and then I'm going to show you using direct quotations that, yes, Jonathan Edwards would describe himself as a five-point Calvinist. Now, the first citation I want to give you here comes from uh, freedom of the will in the introduction section where Edwards actually brings up the term Calvinism. And this is actually unusual in Edwards's writings because Edwards is not one to quote mine for other theologians and put things from them as supports in his own arguments. Edwards very often builds his own arguments and does them in, in rather creative ways. So if you read through his sermons and even his treatises, you're not going to find him quoting Calvin very much at all. He doesn't usually depend on even the Westminster Confession of Faith, although in another video I showed you why he uh, supports that. Um, but here he says something about Calvin rather directly. He says, the term Calvinist is in these days amongst among most a term of greater reproach than the term Arminian. So Edwards is here upset that Arminianism is moving into the churches of the colonies, and he thinks that's a danger and a threat to their reform convictions, such to the point that Edwards is saying here, hey, some people even think being called Calvinist is an insult. Now, here's what he says. Yet I should not take it all amiss to be called a Calvinist for distinction's sake, though I utterly disclaim dependence on Calvin. Okay, so what he's saying here is that he is pleased to be lumped in or to cat be categorized with Calvinism though he doesn't build his theology constructively directly from the works of John Calvin, or believing the doctrines which I hold because he believed, referring to John Calvin, and taught them. And not only that, I cannot justly be charged with believing in everything just as he taught. Okay, so what did he say here? Well, a couple of pretty important things. First, if you want to categorize Jonathan Edwards, he does say here to categorize him as a Calvinist. Secondly, though, he says he does not build his works directly from John Calvin. In fact, it'd be hard to say he builds his works particularly from any uh, individual theologian. Edwards, very much a free thinker, although he stands largely in the mainstream of Reformed Calvinistic and Protestant thought. And then in this last uh, clause here, he indicates that there are several things that he doesn't agree with John Calvin on, and therefore that their viewpoints are not completely synonymous. So if there's a Venn diagram between Edwards and Calvin, there is at least a little bit of non-overlap between them. Now, what I need to do next is going to be a little bit hard for some of us, perhaps even for me, is I want to give a summary of the book Freedom of the Will. Again, this is his hardest book. I remember when I was uh, defending my dissertation at RTS Orlando, I was just really, really hoping that my advisor, uh, Michael Allen, would not ask me direct questions about freedom of the will. I was hoping he'd stay more in religious affections and other things. But nevertheless, I did have to talk about this book a little bit. So in Freedom of the Will, it's a long book. Um, this, this edition right here is about 300 very dense and difficult pages. Um, the official Yale works are going to be even longer, given the critical introductions and the footnotes and things like that. But Edwards is here discussing what it means for human beings to be free. The Arminians, of course, are holding that mankind has a freedom of the will. And by the freedom of the will or the free will, many people are assuming that the will has complete and total liberty to do whatever and exactly what that individual wants without any interference, either from other people or from supposed predispositions within the heart or by influence of God or the devil or the spiritual realm. But no, those free will advocates would, su would suggest that if the will is going to be truly free, it has to have complete liberty and um, separateness from influencing powers to cause that person to choose what they choose. But Edwards disagrees with that. He would say that all choice arises from some disposition within the self. In other words, every single time you make a choice, uh, 
there's a reason why you made that choice. It's not completely arbitrary. For instance, if you had a choice, and this is my example, not Edwards's, is um, to go home today and there's the short road, which is quick and straight and fast. And there's the long road, which is windy and beautiful and scenic. And you're going to choose between one of those two ways. You're not going to choose arbitrarily as though there's no disposition within you that prefers one or the other. But you're always going to choose the path home based on something that resides within you that prefers one of those two choices. So while you are the one who is actually making the choice, there is a reason why you make the choice that you do. And so therefore, Edwards would say that no choice that we ever make is arbitrary and without some preference. Okay, now this is going to be an important thought for Edwards, because the reason why we choose what we choose is, is um, going to be in large part determined then by the kind of person that we truly are on the inside. In other words, we choose according to our dispositions and our preferences. Therefore, for Edwards, there is no choice that has a neutral moral value. Now, uh, in this case, Edwards does give a couple examples. He, he thinks about, for instance, the parable of the Good Samaritan. If the Good Samaritan saw the man injured on the side of the road and he chooses to help him because deep inside he is morally disposed to do good, then we would rightly consider that choice to be good. But if the Good Samaritan chooses to help the man on the side of the road, merely arbitrarily, in other words, he's not moved by any particular compassion or any love for humanity or any sympathy for the person suffering, then we would say then that decision lacks moral value. He seems to have done it arbitrarily or for some other randomized purpose. And so Edwards wants to show us that every choice that we make actually does have a moral component. In fact, Edwards goes very strong in this book to indicate that complete neutrality of the will is actually a myth. Now, this is what the free will argument depends on, that the human being is autonomously neutral in his choosing capacity. But Edwards says, no, that's not really the way it is. We choose because of a disposition within us. So therefore, Edwards makes a very important distinction in this work. He distinguishes between natural ability and moral ability. Now, the Arminians, they will accuse the Calvinists of saying essentially that um, if we don't have free will, then God is compelling us then to sin. And Edwards says, no, it's not exactly like that. That's not what Calvinism is, is implying. In fact, there's a distinction then between natural ability, which is what we are able to do physically, and our moral ability, which is what we are willing to do. And so here, um, Edwards talks about a drunkard, for instance, that a, a drunkard has the natural ability to put down that bottle of wine. There's no reason he's not able to do that. The problem is that he is he lacks the moral ability to do so. So he distinguishes natural ability and moral ability. He gives some positive examples too. He says, let's say there's a woman who is chaste and she is um, sexually faithful to her husband. Of course, she's naturally able to commit an affair and ha have adultery in a different relationship, but she wouldn't do it because she is uh, morally unable to, to, uh, to despise her, her covenantal husband in that way. So Edwards wants to distinguish these two things very importantly. And the reason is that because Edwards is going to defend the Calvinistic view that the reason that we sin is because we are actually sinners. We are disposed in our moral choices. We do have preferences. And even though we can say that our choices are truly choices, that we are actually making those choices in real time, and that the mechanism that makes that choice we can call the will, yet the will is always predisposed morally to make the choices that it does. And the reason that sinner sin, Edwards argues, very Calvinistically, is because man's nature is depraved. Therefore, if man is going to choose to believe in God, in Christ, and to, um, uh, to accept and to receive Christ and the gospel, it requires then for God to do the changing work of the heart that we call conversion, uh, to cause him to be born again or to be regenerated. And so at the end of the book, and I know this is an overly simplified um, summary here, 
Edwards defends two things, both the sovereignty of God and the full responsibility of human beings for the choices that they make. Um, God is absolutely sovereign over all that he has, all that he's made. That's his sovereignty. He providentially rules the universe from beginning to end. And yet it's also true that mankind is morally responsible for the choices and even the predispositions that we have as sinful human beings. And some people have categorized this then as compatibility or compatibilism, because Edwards is arguing here that there's no real tension between the sovereignty of God on one hand and man's responsibility as a moral agent on the other hand. Now, I want to jump to the end of the book. This is the very, very, very last part of the freedom of the will, because this is where Edwards directly addresses the five points of Calvinism. And so here is where Edwards answers as clearly as any other place in all of his writings, whether or not he's a five pointer. And in fact, he is going to affirm all five points of Calvinism. This is not an accident, and he does it very intentionally. And he's going to take us through the TULIP acronym, although he switches up the order just briefly. So I'm going to read a quotation now from each one of the five points of Calvinism as he defends them. Remember, this is his conclusion to the entire book in which he's made a long series of arguments, many biblical arguments, many philosophical arguments, and many illustrative arguments. Okay, so he says this, the things which have been said, okay, so that refers to the whole foregoing part of the book, right? 300 pages of material, obviate some of the chief objections of Arminians, in Arminians against the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity and the corruption of man's nature, whereby his heart is wholly under the power of sin, and he is utterly unable, without the interposition of sovereign grace, to savingly to love God, to believe in Christ, or to do anything that is truly good and acceptable in God's sight. All right. So he says now he has defended Calvinism against the Arminianism charge um, related to man's depravity. And what Edwards is upholding here is that the Calvinists are right in the point T of Tulip. Total depravity is true. And by that, he defines it as man's heart being wholly under the power of sin and being utterly unable without the interposition, in other words, God's got to get involved here. God has to sovereignly do something gracious to enable us to savingly love God and to believe in Christ. Remember, everything is about the disposition of the heart for why we choose what we choose. And Edwards is saying here, because of sin, we would not choose God unless God interposed himself graciously to change the heart and essentially rewire our affections, if I can use that kind of language. Then Edwards goes to irresistible grace. Now notice this is kind of out of order in terms of the TULIP acronym. This is the I for irresistible grace. And he says, the things which have been observed, in other words, the whole book foregoing, the previous whole book, do also take off the main objections of Arminianism against the doctrine of efficacious grace. Now he calls it efficacious grace here, but later he's going to use the word irresistible. And at the same time, prove the grace of God and a sinner's conversion, if there be any grace or divine influence in the affair, to be efficacious, yea, and irresistible too. So notice he adds the word irresistible too, just to qualify his previous word efficacious, which means it works. It does what it is intended and designed to do. God's grace is not kind of flimsy and weak, but if God intends to change the heart by his grace, then it is, in a sense, irresistible. It is effective. It does the job. It completes the task. If by irresistible is meant that which is attended with a moral necessity, which it is impossible should ever be violated by any resistance. In other words, if God sets his saving affections upon a man like the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, he is going to then be able to effect that change of his heart through his gracious work, the work of his Holy Spirit. Unconditional election. The things which have been said do likewise answer the chief objections against the doctrine of God's universal and absolute decree and afford infallible proof that the doctrine and of the doctrine of absolute eternal personal election in particular. So this is not just a kind of general election where God um, foreordains to call a bunch of people at some point, at some point in time in the future somewhere, 
know that God rather elects particular people, particularly from before the foundations of the earth. So here, Edwards supports that great Calvinistic doctrine of predestination. Although remember, Calvin did not invent the doctrine of predestination. Luther held it, Augustine held it, many of the great reformers, the Puritans, many, many, many people in the early church held it. And of course, predestination is rooted in scriptural language. Predestination is not a term that Calvin made up. It's a term that comes straight out of the Bible, Ephesians 1, Romans 8, Romans 9, etc. That's a whole nother Bible study, and we'll do that again at some other point. Now, for limited atonement, this would be probably the most debated of the five points. This is where some people jump off the bag and uh, jump off the bandwagon and say, "No, I'm a four-point Calvinist." But Edwards is pretty clear here on limited atonement as well. He says, "From these things, it will inevitably follow that, however, Christ, in some sense, in some sense, may be said to die for all and to redeem all visible Christians, yea, the whole world by his death." Semicolon. Let's pause there. Because Edwards acknowledges that our, there are passages in the scripture in which it speaks of Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, dying for the world, or in, in some sense for all men, or some language like that, or God desiring all to be saved, those kinds of passages. And yes, the Bible does speak about Christ being the Savior of the world, and especially those who believe. But Edwards is saying here that that, that, is, that is true in one sense. It's true in the sense that Christ is the only Savior of the world. And it's also true that he is the Savior of all tribes and nations and kinds. For instance, uh, Revelation 7, 9, right? That there will be some that are in heaven from all, every tribe and nation and tongue and kind. But that doesn't mean every particular individual is going to be saved. And so here we have to go past the semicolon and look what else he says. Yet there must be something particular in the design of his death with respect to such as he intended should actually be saved thereby. Now we're talking five points here, aren't we? As appears by what has been shown, God has the actual salvation or redemption of a certain number in his proper and absolute design. That's the very heart of the doctrine of limited or particular atonement, isn't it? And of a certain number only, and therefore such a design can be prosecuted in anything God does in order to the salvation of men. So Edwards here admits that there are passages that speak of Christ dying for all, kind of gen generally, but when it comes down to God's ordained decree, his decree of sovereign election, the very design of the death of Christ does accomplish that which God intended it to accomplish. In other words, Jesus didn't fail in his mission to come save. Jesus came and he specifically saved those whom God had predestined from before the foundations of the world. So Edwards rather clearly here upholds the doctrine of limited atonement, that most debated of the five points. Here's another paragraph, just to clarify. And indeed, with such a particularity and a limitation, now he's using the word L on purpose, of redemption will as infallibly follow from the doctrine of God's foreknowledge as from that of his decree. For it is impossible in strictness of speech that God should prosecute a design or aim at a thing which at the same time most perfectly knows will not be accomplished and that he should use endeavors for that which is beside his decree. So previously in Freedom of the Will, Edwards argued that God's foreknowledge of all things also necessarily entails his predestination of all things, because if God knows something is going to come to pass, then it is certain and sure that that thing will, in fact, come to pass. And here, Edwards takes that concept and applies it then to the limited and particular redemption or atonement of the elect. Okay, so now Edwards has essentially affirmed all five points of Calvinism by the time we get to the end of the treatise. Um, well, okay, I, I skipped one. Perseverance of the saints. Let's do this quickly. And as the doctrines of efficacious grace and absolute election do certainly follow from the things which have been proved in the preceding discourse, so some of the main foundations of the doctrine of perseverance are thereby established. If the beginning of true faith and holiness and a man's becoming a true saint at first, don't depend on the self-determining power of the will. In other words, you don't keep yourself in grace because of your will's strength. But on the determining efficacious grace of God, it may well be argued 
that it is so also with respect to man's being continued saints or persevering in faith and holiness. Okay, so now we, now, sorry about that. Now we've got all five points of TULIP affirmed and agreed to by Jonathan Edwards here in the Freedom of the Will. So let's look at then a summary statement. This is very much towards the very last bit of the work. Edwards summarizes the whole book by saying this, the conversion of a sinner being not owing to a man's self-determination, not the freedom of the will, but to God's determination in eternal election, which is absolute and depending on the sovereign will of God and not on the free will of man, as is evident from what has been said, and it being very evident from the scriptures that the eternal election, which there is of saints to faith and holiness, is also an election of them to eternal salvation. Hence, their appointment to salvation must also be absolute and not depending on their contingent, self-determining will. From all which it follows, that it is absolutely fixed in God's decree that all true saints shall persevere to actual eternal salvation. And so in that paragraph, then, Edwards affirms the five points of Calvinism by way of a complete and exhaustive summary. So I think um, the point of me going through these quotations here is to show you that it, it cannot really be argued that Jonathan Edwards is anything less than a five-point Calvinist. He's clearly setting out to defend Calvinism, properly so-called. He um, very articulately, articulately defends each of one of the five points and then most conspicuously affirms each one by name in the conclusion of freedom of the will. So was Edwards a five point Calvinist? Absolutely. All right. That's all I've got for you today. Uh, thank you so much for checking in to this channel. I do love you lots and we'll talk to you later.